This is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode number 536, recorded on Wednesday, October 14th, 2015. Shadowy Pervs. Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your head with a novel frequency, bird chatter, and digital rats. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! Birds of a feather flock together, or so the saying goes, and nowhere is this saying more clearly illustrated than in the American political system. We're still more than a year away from the next presidential election, and political candidates can be seen, be seen flocking with each other like never before. Even odd bird fellows make wing with mesmerizing murmuration, taking off from any issue to land on the same branch of ideology. As if politicians only came in two species, or is it that Washington only has two trees in its town? Actual bird species are nearly 10,000. In the second half of today's show, we will learn much more about birds of similar feathers, which you must be for having flocked together with us once more for another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. Kind of mind that can't get enough. I wanna learn everything. I wanna fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I wanna know what's happening. What's happening? What's happening this week in science? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening this week in science? Science to you, Kirsten and Blair. And good science to you, Justin, Blair, everyone out there in Twistland. Science abounds. <laughs> and we have another full show. Another full, full show. I'm so excited of all the stories that we have tonight. It's kind of a super sci-fi weird show, but I'm excited about that. <laughs> I know. Wait, where's the theremin when you need one? I need to get one. I really need. The show needs one. Can we work that into the budget? I need to work that into the budget. I got one right here. I can just do it. You don't need one. You have me. Oh, dear. All right. <laughs> this like, week's... It sounds like the backup vocals to the Star Trek uh, intro. <laughs> not okay. dissimilar. That was, that was not bad. Or a haunted house, I'm not really sure. <laughs> it is Halloween month. So anyway, we have a great show ahead. Tonight I brought stories about chimeras, pervs, and rat brains. Justin, what'd you bring? I have a Cretaceous furball fracking with your health, an unexpected brain boost, and uh, something else. Ooh, yeah, a new type of memory. Ooh, I like memory. News, new ones and old ones. All right, Blair, what's the animal corner going to hold for us? I have pollution, doom, and gloom. I have zebra <laughs> finches, and I have fruit fly communication. Nice. Well, let us get this show on the road. All right, I'm jumping in deep end first. Chimeras. That's what I'm going to jump into first. So who knows what a chimera is here? It's the Greek monster that has two different heads, right? Well, there that is one kind of chimera, right? Bad this omen. Being, not being a right? science show. Is, oh, uh, that's not real? This right. being a science oh, okay. show, it's uh, something to do with when you take the genes of one thing and put it into something where it wasn't before. Yeah, when you start and mixing the cells of different organisms together. So, um, it's it's thought a little bit that mothers become a little bit of a, of a chimera because they end up with cells from their babies, and so they have uh, blood cells and potentially neuronal cells from their babies. So mothers can be a bit of a chimera. But we're also doing research into the idea of chimeras, specifically with the idea of, all right, can we take human cells and put them into other animals, say pigs, for uh, maybe getting pigs to grow organs for us? 
because we need all sorts of organ transplants and we don't have enough donors um, it's, or it's just hard to get donor organs to the right place at the right time. So if we had a, a good supply from pigs, that would be great. But there are kind of ethical considerations to consider about taking human parts and putting them in pigs or at least some people have ethical considerations about it. So. Um, the research has already begun in this area. People have been looking into how we can mix different cell cell lines together. Um, we have taken mice, mouse, and rat cells, mixed them together, grown different animals, pancreases, and different animals, and we we know that this works. We know that as a concept, we can get out. We we should be able to get our organs to grow in pigs fairly well. Because one big problem with pig organs, when we just wanted, if we just took a pig organ, which is the right size and potentially the, has all the right stuff to substitute for a human organ, um, there's a problem with rejection. Because pig organs are full of pervs. Hmm. And I don't mean like pervy individuals. I mean porcine endogenous retroviruses. Well, of course that's what you meant. Of course that's what I meant. And so these pervs, um, when you transplant a pig organ into a human, they end up coming out of the pig because an organ becomes part of the entire body system. It's not isolated within the body. All the cells in there start communicating with the cells of the body that it's in. And so these endogenous retroviruses make their way out in and get identified by the human body as not good. And so then you have rejection issues, massive inflammation responses, immune system goes crazy, not very good at all, which is why you have to have all sorts of immunosuppressive drugs if you're going to be implanting a pig heart or something like that. So now um, a new study published by... Um, Oh, actually, no. Who is doing the new study of the chimeric? Ah, there's another thing. So these are two different studies that I'm getting very confused. But that's okay. That's okay. Because <laughs> they both involve <laughs> pigs, right? <laughs> yeah. Welcome, so, welcome to live live radio, folks. Welcome to live radio. Welcome I just got my two studies confused because they're right next to each other. And also, really interesting. So... Um, Anyway, there is some research uh, in which research in which um, people at the Salk Institute researchers um, are trying to have proposed research to the National Institute of Health to start putting um, human cells into the embryos of pigs that have been genetically modified to lack specific organs like kidneys or a liver or pancreas. And so since the embryo lacks those organs, you inject the human stem cells in. This human stem cells should integrate appropriately and take the place of the pig organs. And so you would cons uh, possibly produce pigs growing human organs. Now, now... And so this, well, is, the uh, where the chi this is the yeah, chimera issue. This is the chimera thing. And so then, and then, and then rationally, reasonably, Two, two, I would assume two directions go with this chimera. This pig with a human liver, say, uh, or human kidney. You could A, do research uh, on this pig, uh, on mm -hmm. the effects of liver, and you've got an actual human liver that's, that's it's having to react to, so you'd have a better model than you had before just doing a pure animal experiment. On right. the other hand, also, the avenue could also go down Having a a literal organ farm for humans, so for humans, people exactly. People who were looking for, who needed a, a kidney or who needed a liver transplant, uh, would need look no further than the local farmers market. Yes. Yeah, so, um, this does bother some people because number one, you're using stem cells that are human embryonic pluripotent stem cells so there are some ethical issues there of taking these stem cells and putting them into pig embryos. Um, the second issue that people want to discuss is um, whether or not the cells are only going to make these particular organs or could they possibly end up in the brain of the pig? Could these human embryonic cells 
end up migrating to other areas of the body and going into something uh, like and, and forming neurons in the brain and affecting the intelligence of the animal. And so these are things we do not know. And this work has, there's a kibosh put on it right now. The NIH has said, hey, hold on a second. We don't know if we want to give you money for that. So uh, we're not going to give anybody money for this kind of stuff for a while. And they're actually in the process of setting up a... Uh, a symposium in uh, November during which they're going to consider these uh, these research possibilities of chimeric uh, combination of human and pig cells. But oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Well, well, I, I guess I guess uh, go ahead. I mean, the the, the idea that we're going to end up with a sentient pig out of this uh, seems exceedingly far fetched to me. However. If we could, why wouldn't we? Because that's an awesome frontier to go down. Yeah. So, this is the the question is, you know, what we need to have these conversations, and the researchers who are doing this work are actually very excited that uh, that the NIH NIH is taking this so seriously and is planning on considering it. So, um, that doesn't mean that there isn't private funding for this kind of work, but in terms of um, our government and the money that it has to offer. This is a no-no right now, but it's under consideration. However, I started talking about the PERV sequences, right? These PERV sequences were the, ta the target of a new experiment that was just recently published in which George Church from Harvard University used CRISPR to target these sequences in uh, the cells, in, in uh in cells in a dish, so pig, pig kidney cells, and they targeted 62 of these PERV sequences. They all have like a common gene sequence associated with them, and this is the first time that this many gene sequences have been targeted using CRISPR, and it was successful. And so what they were able to do, uh, they obliterated, according to this uh, Science News article, obliterated every instance of the targeted gene and this is the greatest number of gene changes so far achieved with a single round of CRISPR. So this is just one round of gene editing. And then those cells showed up to a 1,000-fold reduction in their ability to infect human kidney cells with PERV in a lab dish. So potentially the chimera issue could be a non-issue if the CRISPR research continues uh, successfully. So what we're seeing is if we can get rid of the factors that lead to rejection and infection, then it may be a non-issue entirely. Because then we would just have a pig kidney. Yeah. Mm. We, all, we already use, sometimes I, when people get um, heart surgery, they use pig valves, right? Yes. So that's because it's the right size and kind of structure very the similar structure is correct yeah. yes so yeah. so and i and i know no not everyone maybe maybe few people will agree with me but it seems it seems odder to me it seems weirder to me that i would be walking around with a pig liver than if i were walking around with a human liver grown in a pig and i would I, agree I, I know yeah. that that's that's really at this far down the line, you've got an organ that you didn't start with that's now doing a bodily function for you, and it's working. Who cares? Right. Right. Uh, but but still, I would I if I had my choice, we can we can successfully do the operation. You can have a pig liver that was uh, designed so it won't be pervy, and we have this other human liver that was grown in a pig uh, that'll work just as well. Take your pick. I would go. Right. I would go with the chimera. You right. would go with the chimera. And then there was the option we've talked about before involving 3D printing where basically you have a petri dish version of a liver. <laughs> so Right. So there will be many options for uh, organs in the future, hopefully. And given, and given that option, actually I take the third option. Give me one give me one made in the lab. That's that's the third one. Yeah, so, so I'd probably take that. One. One of one of the interesting uh, things that was not published in the paper uh, by Church and his colleagues is that uh, he says that his group has created pig embryos with inactivated PERV sequences, and the next step would be to raise these cloned pigs um, and have them be retrovirus-free organs. So he's he's already moving forward in the 
the field of research, although they haven't, they haven't, they're not ready to discuss it yet. Mm. But he says they have successfully created these perv-free embryos for pigs. Yeah, I don't think I'd discuss anything now that they're just banning stuff as soon as they hear about it, right? <laughs> like, I, that, that's it. Yeah, I'm doing something in my lap. Don't worry. Uh, talk to you once I'm done and it shown a successful time. Like, this is so ridiculous, because really, it's like, think about this. At, this. at this point, what we're discussing is whether we do something really awesome and complicated with science, or do something else really awesome and complicated with science, but somebody who's who's got their hands on the purse strings is like, weirded out by one of them, and just probably doesn't understand the other one yet. Uh, or either of them, really. But it's that's too bad. I think it's important for us to talk about these things, though. Bring them up, mm -hmm. and you know, now everybody who's heard this story, you can go out, search out more information on your own, and figure out what weirds you out and why. Maybe you know, figure right. out you know what are the ethical concerns for you. It's, that should be something we should be discussing, but, right? But don't stop research just because you don't understand everything yet. I mean, this isn't. If we were talking about an infectious disease and creating it in the lab, like the, like the problems that that's had at the military base labs and stuff, I could see having questions about whether or not this lab should be doing this type of research based on its security and blah, 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 blah. Well, it's, it uh, sounded this, to me like it was about the funding. It wasn't about mm -hmm. shutting down what was happening. It's about whether or not they're going to extend this grant. Thing. Which is whether Obviously or not they're going to give money. It has to do thing. with with these people's comfort factor, and I understand that to us there's nothing wrong with this, but I can understand also that to some people it is kind of weird. And some of the stuff that we do now, the way we get some of our vaccines, might seem pretty weird to people, <sighs> but we benefit from it, and so yeah. we kind of just have to wait for it to become Normal. less creepy. <laughs> Well, it's, normalized. It's yeah. Less creepy or weird. I mean, but also you know, these same people who are freaking out about it probably have bacon and eggs, but uh, for breakfast, but have never been to a rendering plant or a a chicken mass chicken egg. Well, and store. that is a a good point I mean, like, too. Where is the line between what we're getting as chemical energy in the source of food, and then what we're putting in our body in another way? Well, not that point, but I don't watch knife. That's not even and, what and, I meant, and, but and it's funny. The question, and that's the not question. what I meant, but the, like, if it has to do with uh, the, 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 the strangeness of what goes on from something that starts as an animal and ends as food, the processes that we're using to create science to do these organs is a lot of the same, not the same stuff, but it's, it's about as complicated mm -hmm. and, and should be going on behind the scenes without anybody seeing it. Just like I could never go to a rendering plant because then I'd have to be a vegetarian. But we have decided. We have decided as a society, and there are still people who, you know, bring up ethical uh, concerns about the state of these, uh, these, how these animals are grown for food, how we render them, all this stuff. This is all. There are ethical debates about this still going on, especially as vegetarianism and veganism grows in popularity in, in the Western world. But in terms of something like this, we're talking about chimera. You know, we're mixing human cells with the cells of other animals and so how far do we go do you know the the human ape hybrid it's still experimentation between human cells and primate cells is still completely off the table around the world as far as i'm aware um, the mm -hmm. international community has agreed that that is not something that we should be doing um, but other species where where is the line? And so it's good that this conversation keeps can, keeps going on. What do we accept? What do we not accept? Why? We need to ask ourselves these things. Um, my uh, my other story here is part of the Blue Brain ongoing project, which is trying to someday map a human brain. They made a small step forward and have published in the journal Cell last week. They mapped a slice of rat brain. So if you can imagine, here they, they want to map someday the entire human brain. Imagine the brain sitting inside your head right now, how heavy your head is and how big and dense that brain is, full of neurons. Well, they managed to map a single slice of rat brain which is much smaller. It's like a little teeny tiny part of your brain, but and, and then only a slice of that. And in this 
a digital model which in which they have uh, they've replicated 31,000 neurons, 207 cell subtypes, approximately 37 million synapses, no blood vessels, no non-neuronal cells in the brain, runs on a supercomputer and it requires a billion calculations every 25 microseconds to mimic wow. the function of just a third of a cubic millimeter of brain tissue. That's, wow. What a so, there's a ton of they're 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 getting stuff you know they're they're modeling how these neurons are connecting to each other and the researchers say that it is fairly similar to what is seen in an active rat brain or in an active slice of rat brain so it's not completely accurate but they're working on getting it more accurate so they're testing models of how neurons work and so potentially this single slice will allow them to move more easily into larger digital uh, models the problem though it's still you know this huge thing it's a supercomputer a billion <laughs> calculations every 25 microseconds not even a second, every 25 microseconds. Um, and so this is just, there's a lot of stuff being put together and there are a lot of people wondering what this is really going to get us. So, you know, sure. hopefully it will give us a deeper understanding of the brain. Um, but it's, uh, it's just interesting to note that we are getting closer. We're slowly visualizing. We're getting closer to knowing how far we are. <laughs> yes, right. That's really what it's about. Is if the if the rat brain is that complex, and it's not even this doesn't even include you know this is this is this is not non-neuronal cells in the brain. This is not blood vessels. So it's not accurately modeling the yeah. exact behavior of the brain because there's a lot of other stuff going on between blood and uh, nutrients and other cell types. But they've done you know 207 cell subtypes is a massive achievement. So. Congratulations to them. A slice of rat brain in a dish, in a computer. Justin, what you got? Uh, well, it's often been depicted in popular culture that there was a time when cavemen lived concurrently with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, known to be false. This didn't happen. However, it is true that our ancestors walked amongst the dinosaurs, albeit on four legs. Now, a discovery of enormous detail has emerged from the fossil record. A 125 million year old mammal in Spain was found with preserved mammalian hair structures and inner organs. This uh, push, pushes back the earliest record of this sort of find by 60 million years. So not the, that it's the oldest mammal in the fossil record, uh, but that's the oldest example of fur and a lot of the organ tissue. Uh, because of the way this happened to be preserved. The specimen named Spinolestes xenotharosus, thar tharosus, uh, something like that, was fossilized with remarkably intact guard hairs under for tiny hedgehog-like spines Ooh. and even evidence of a fungal hair infection. Ah! <laughs> oh, no! Poor buddy! Poor, I know. Uh, the unusually well-preserved fossil also contains an external earlobe. This is sort of the, uh, that's very interesting, this is, uh, this is sort of the highlights of our Cretaceous furball, right? So remarkably modern mammalian hair and skin structures, uh, such as compound follicles in which multiple hairs emerge from the same pore, uh, small spines, this is an incredible amount of detail they've, they've sussed from this, small spines around, the, around a tenth of a millimeter in diameter on its back, similar to a modern hedgehog's and the African spiny mice. Uh, which appears to be formed by the fusion of filaments at follicles during development. It has abnormally truncated hairs that are evidence of fungal skin infection, uh, which is seen widely amongst living mammals today. Uh, a, the large external ear, uh, or ears, the earliest known example in the mammalian fossil record of these ears, as well as dermal scutes, plate-like structures made of skin keratin, which are uh, a more developed form of that would be seen in a modern, say, an armadillo, mm -hmm. or uh, what's a, or pangolins? I don't know what pangolins are. They're the they're um a relative to the anteater, and they're covered in plates. Hmm. Uh, they also found that uh, 
Spinal Acidies has extra articulations between the vertebrae, which strengthened its spinal column, and they find one their correlation with modern-day mammals such as the armored shrews and armadillos. They possess a similar structure. And based on that structure, the authors speculate that this might provide a clues to the lifestyle of the, of the Cretaceous furball. Uh, they say armored shrews, for example, use their exceptional vertebral strength to push apart logs or dead palm leaves to feed on the insects within. So even a little uh, behave, perhaps behavioral insight into the critter based on this. Now, a pretty hmm. small little guy, roughly 24 centimeters in length, uh, and weighed no more than 70 grams. A, about the size of a modern-day juvenile rat. Its uh, teeth and skeletal features indicate it was a ground dweller that ate insects. Yeah, they actually have they actually have in this process. Uh, what is it? Phosphatic fossilization is the rare way in which this was preserved and fossilized. They have individual hair follicles and bulbs. Uh, they have in the organs, they can see some of the, the, the lung tissue. They can see an area where they believe the diaphragm was. I mean, they've got a pretty amazing view of the soft tissue in this. Hmm. And they even found iron-rich wow. residues, which were associated with the liver. Hmm. So, so it, it ended up in a very special place to be preserved like this, because this is not, this is, you don't get tissues like this that are this old. I mean, usually these soft tissues, these integuments, the skin, the, all this stuff, they, they disappear. They're one of the first things to go. So this is amazing. It's got what, a lot I, of stuff going on. Yeah, I, I wonder what exactly were the, uh, were the characteristics of the place it was, it died and it was laid down and fossilized that allowed everything to be preserved in that manner. Well, he had a fungal infection. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, phosphatic fossilization, though. I don't know if maybe that uh, only happens in a in a certain way. Yeah. Hmm. With phosphate, pho yeah, phosphatic with phosphate. I don't know. How fascinating! I love it. We'll learn more about those older critters and ancestors of the modern mammals. Things where it's. I think one of the neat things from these is that. A find like this is that you go, oh, these these traits were around a lot longer ago than we first than we thought. Mm -hmm. We thought they evolved more recently, and so this is an interesting. That's an interesting find in itself. Well, the the spines are especially interesting because we see them today in two types of animals that are totally unrelated: the porcupines and the hedgehogs. And hedgehogs and tenrex are related; they both have the spines. But porcupines are in a totally different area of mammals, so oh, they're I... rodents, and uh, hedgehogs and tenrex are insectivores. So they're they're totally not related, but they showed up. Uh, coincidentally, you know, convergent evolution. But we've seen them again. Apparently, 125 million years ago as well. Yeah, and this is, yeah, 125 yeah. million years ago. And so, yeah, it's such an interesting sort of hodgepodge of features that you can see ending up other places preserved, whether whether it's through, it's preserved in the DNA or this is uh, co uh, what's it, uh, evolution. Uh, but what's, also evolution. Mm -hmm. what's also interesting to me, though, is that this is 125 million years ago. And this is a pretty decently evolved little right. mammal running about. We would have expected this little rudimentary shrew thing, or at least that's how mm -hmm. it's always been depicted before, is that when dinosaurs roamed the earth, there were these little shrewy, mousy things, and that was it. And then mammals exploded after that. But based on all of these crazy adaptations, chances are there's a lot more going on than we thought. Rats. They were rat-like organisms, not just shrew-like organisms. <laughs> Distinct. Oh, rats. You know what time it is? Is it that time again? It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves all creatures and cried at all. Five pet, little pet, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels.
right, I'm going to talk about a little bit of a downer to start today. Apologies. But pollution is bad. <laughs> Especially bad when it's runoff and it is going into rivers and streams and affecting fish. That's not so good. Coho salmon on the West Coast turns out very susceptible to pollution and runoff. And that toxic runoff from highways, parking lots, and de other developed surfaces is killing a lot of coho salmon all across the West Coast. And a new study is looking exactly at what is killing the coho salmon. And believe it or not, there's a little ray of hope that comes out of this study. So to start off, to explain how they were looking at how this runoff was affecting the coho salmon, um, this study, uh, they took coho salmon and they took them from fisheries, um, they took them from hatcheries, and they, they tried to make their own cocktail of toxic runoff. What's interesting is that when they first tried to do that, they didn't have very good success. So. What they found is that in these streams, when toxic runoff occurs, coho salmon are dying in 24 hours. Sometimes as little as a few hours, they drop dead. They made this toxic runoff cocktail from toxins that they found in the water, and it wasn't killing the salmon. Fish lived. Fish didn't care. Yeah. So there was something else going on here. And they did find in previous studies a direct correlation with the number of roads or the amount of surface area of roads in an area and the number of uh, coho dying. There was a direct correlation. So it definitely had to do with roads. So chances are it's something like brake dust or uh, lead or something else that's coming off of cars on these roadways that are that are causing it to have this intense response that these coho are dying in such huge numbers and so much. So when they took the actual runoff and they gave it or they put it in the water where these coho were, all of the coho died within 24 hours, 100%. Wow. Sometimes it was less than four hours they died. So here's where it gets interesting. With this study, they were testing out um, a special kind of filtration technique where they basically use, they call, with, uh, they call them rain gardens, they're filtration columns, um, and they put things like sand and special kinds of soil and gravel in these usually around three feet of filtration columns. And so all of the runoff goes through that before it goes into the waterways. And they found that after putting them through these three foot high soil column layers with gravel, sand, compost, bark, they exposed the coho to that afterwards, the coho survived as well as they did in clean water. Nice. Yeah, so they showed, the, the test showed the filtration columns reduced toxic heavy chemicals by 58%, and it reduced polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are byproducts of gasoline combustion, by 94%. And so this was super effective, and it just shows that even though we're not exactly sure what is killing the salmon, that this very simple, cheap, an easy way of filtering this runoff was extremely effective. Yeah, so it's cheap, but it, it's a, so it's extremely effective. But then mm -hmm. implementation is going to be trying to figure out how to put it on this on the sides of roads or mm -hmm. right near rivers. Is that yeah? The so and rivers where these sam these salmon inhabit, that's, um, they're going to have to find that's a way the to... endeavor. Yeah, yeah the endeavor right. will have to be creating these berms for runoff. Exactly. So the, the plan is to make it required in all new areas or areas that are being updated, anywhere where there's construction going on on roadways, to make this right. part of the update. So right. in that way, on the West Coast, we do 
repave roads, we update storm drains, we do this stuff a lot. So if we can just make it part of the process from now on out, it could potentially make a pretty big difference on the salmon populations. As it is right now, the salmon are in a lot of trouble. They're dying off in massive quantities. And not to mention, they're kind of the canary in the coal mine. So the fact that they are dying means that other animals that are more resilient could start showing signs of wear and also that it could start getting into our water and that that could be a problem for us, especially because we don't know exactly what it is that's ending up in the water column that's causing this problem. Yeah, I think that the, the question here, though, it re relates to it being storm water mostly, you know, like the typical amount of just small amount of run runoff is going to get from a small little storm is probably going to get absorbed by the ground near the roadway, right? You're going to have some amount of absorption before it ends up in the water. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that absorption is going to, tip, similar to this thing that they've created, this filter, it will filter. Um, but it's those big storms when large amounts of water come through that you have, especially after periods of time where there has been no rain, Mm -hmm. And you have lots of stuff coming off all at once. Oh. How do you build something big enough to make sure that it can handle all that? You right, know? because we have a drought right now in California. There's not been a lot of rain. And what's coming? El Nino. And so lots this is of dead salmon. <laughs> and so that's the problem. Lots and lots of rain could lead to lots of dead salmon, but let's remember, again, that that could lead to other things that we don't know about yet. Now, the good news is that this all came from the NOAA Fisheries Northwest uh, Science Center in Seattle. So it's NOAA-related, which means it's government-related, which means potentially we could see some change here. And in some places already, they do have it as part of the future growth strategy that they incorporate quote, clean water design into all future growth, which would mean right. these columns. So it's, there's, a, there's a couple of things that are so interesting about this to me. And the first is that they, they had such success with this natural solution that is also super easy to enact. But the second thing that I found mind-boggling, and I'll mention it again, is that we don't know what it is that killed the coho in the runoff. This is this is what I was gonna say too. Like, this is the part I was missing. That I'm like, maybe I'm just I, I could be being an inattentive listener, right? But they still don't. They said, okay, the runoff does it. We had all the chemicals that we know of that we've identified in this runoff. We put it in there. Meh, salmon don't care, right? Yeah. Yep. But the actual runoff, salmon die. Mm -hmm. This tells me that something is missing. That there's something that can kill salmon in 24 hours where mm -hmm. all the other chemicals that we know of cannot that are Correct. in this runoff, yep. what are we missing? What are we not even identifying yep. that's killing them? That's mm -hmm. frightening. Right. So what they put into the original brew <laughs> was uh, metals, components of crude oil, and other toxins. However, it didn't work and so their best guess at this point is that it's unknown toxins from exhaust, leaking oil, dust from brakes, or tire dust as they wear. All of those are options. They have not mm -hmm. tested any of those things okay. yet. Well, test that. Can't be too hard. Yeah. Test that, that other test, then, then make mm -hmm. your recommendation. Because that's pretty frightening. Let's yeah. talk about something less frightening and <laughs> okay. happy making. <laughs> Let's talk about one of Kiki's favorite things, zebra finches. <laughs> meep, 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 yes. meep, meep, so, meep. in Kiki's extensive time with zebra finches, I'm sure that you noticed that they sound different at different times of year, in different social situations. Did you notice this? Social situations, for sure. Um, I don't think I ever... I don't think I ever really put anything on time of year. I never really tracked that so much. But definitely different social situations. So whether or not they were in a large group cage, whether or not they were alone in a cage, but there were other birds in cages around, whether or not they were a pair in a cage, whether or not um, it was some stranger coming into the room. You know, all, all sorts of different sounds, yes. Now, did you notice different songs 
and also different calls? Um, I don't know. Not so much different calls, but maybe different. Um, I guess just slight differences in the in just very slight differences in the the tone or the way they sounded. Well, it turns out. Scientists from the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology in Germany have taken very close a very close look at the call repertoire and calling behavior of zebra finches. And a lot of other people have studied differences in songs and a lot of songbirds, zebra finches included. But a lot of a lot of speculation has been made about different calls that birds make, but it's much harder to identify all the different calls, so there hasn't really been a lot of research on this. <laughs> so what these guys from the Max Planck Institute did is they fitted zebra finches with teeny tiny backpacks. And I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> they were radio transmitter backpacks, and they oh, were able cute. to record all, the entire what they would call call repertoire of an individual. And so they had 32 finches, they were wearing their backpacks. First they were kept in single sex aviaries so that they got used to their backpacks. <laughs> and then they started recording when the researchers transferred four males and four females into a large aviary. After that, as zebra finches do, they started to form pairs. And soon, they started gathering nesting materials, uh, they started building nests, and in, eventually a lot of them started laying eggs. Um, now, zebra finches are famous for uh, finding lifelong partners, which we've done stories before about how there's, sometimes there's cheating, there's other things like that, but for the most part, they, yeah. they find a lifelong partner, as far as the other partner is concerned. So, <laughs> <laughs> what they found was that their calls were different depending on the part of the breeding cycle that they were in, whether they had not found a pair yet, whether they were building a nest, whether they were sitting on eggs. And the calls were characterized by very specifically timed back and forth interactions. And that over time, more and more were directed towards their partner and less and less are directed towards other members of the group. Interesting. Here's yeah. where it gets even more interesting, <laughs> is mm -hmm. that the calls changed depending on, like I said, what part of the breeding cycle they were in, but that also means that if their environmental conditions changed, that changed their tactic at that moment, their calls would change. So that meant that means, for example, if there was rain that allowed more food that allowed them to build a nest, the calls would suddenly switch to this intensely pair bonded behavior that was more um, more commonly noticed along with nest building and egg laying. So it would go in cycles back and forth because the zebra finches can breed year round. Yeah, they they breed all the time. Well, it's yeah. um, it, it depends on their environment. And exactly. if you have these birds in captivity, you know that if you want them to breed, just put them in the bathroom where there's or near the kitchen sink where water runs all the mm -hmm. time. They hear the sound mm -hmm. of the of the running water and they go, "Oh, it's time to have babies." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so their chatter changed mm -hmm. when they thought it was raining and it was time to have babies again. So it's almost as if they were they were chatting with each other about what time of what time it was. <laughs> time to lay eggs. <laughs> Is that that time? It's that time again. Yes, it's that time again, honey. Okay, honey. Thanks. It's that time again. Okay, honey. Let's have babies. All right, honey. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, uh, I I think it's uh I think it's going to rain. You always think it's going to rain. No, I think I might. I think I might hear rain outside. No, that's just the wind, dear. Just relax. <laughs> Not really. I, I swore. But well, this is really interesting, um, even more so because recently there was another study uh, that we briefly reported on uh, about zebra finches uh, being having their mates taken away from them and then having being given strangers to mate with, and how some of them were able to kind of pick up and have some success at mating, but really it had to do with how well they 
spoke to each other. Mm. And, though, and if they had calls that were, com if they were completely different vocally, then they just, they never succeeded. They would not have babies together and they just, they floundered when it came to the, the mating success. It was like they spoke a different language or something. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so this is very interesting that um, that shows that even as as they're together longer, more as their monogamy is is made stronger, that this this pair calling is used to make it stronger potentially. Yeah, exactly. Now, do you want to talk about fruit fly pheromones, or do we want to wait that for that for later? What do you think? Can you do it quick? I'll do, I'll it. do it as quick as I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, an accidental discovery this week related to fruit fly pheromones. You might not have heard us talk about fruit fly pheromones before. That's because we were not sure that they used scent cues at all. So a, uh, a researcher at John Hops Hopkins accidentally discovered how male fruit flies lay down an odorant or a pheromone that attracts both males and females. So it signals where to lay eggs and it also signals where there's delicious food. And the methodology behind this is pretty interesting but it also would be pretty long-winded so be sure to check out our show notes to see how it worked and how it was accidentally discovered. But in the end, they found that a pheromone known as 9-trichosine flags a location as an ideal place for flies to mate, settle down, have kids. <laughs> and so they were, th through a, a long, arduous process, not only did they figure out it was only males that laid down the pheromone, but also that it was the sp specific pheromone, 9 trichocene and that females laid five times more eggs where this pheromone was laid. So not only did it attract male and female flies as if there was food there, but that it was it was shown to be a perfect nursery. Uh, and I'm gonna have to go to the show notes because my favorite part of this story is probably how they accidentally I love the accidental discovery aspects of, the, of, of science. Yeah, so, this, so it, the, the long and short of it is that it had to do with flavored air on a glass dish that was black that looked kind of like it was a pinched square in the, in the edges. Um, and they would put in an odor that smelled like food. The flies would congregate in that area. They'd take away the odor. They'd They'd flush it with clean air, and the flies would still go back to that same area where the odor was before. Interesting. Yeah, and then once they put a gel down, which allowed females to lay eggs, they noticed five times more eggs being laid where that odor was before. And so um, they realized s somehow these flies were marking the territory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then using a solvent, they were able to pull whatever the odor was that the flies were leaving behind, spread it out, and it would attract flies where that was. And so then they that, threw. Therefore, therefore, they were also ruling out that this was some sort of fly memory of where the exactly. fly yes. using the solvent to get rid of uh, a potential tagging spot. And then also, as the solvent ran, then, mm -hmm. oh, now there's flies all over where our solvent ran which means we may have moved something about. Exactly. And then from that solvent that had whatever this mystery pheromone was in it, uh, they used gas chromatography mass spectrometry to figure out what the molecular makeup of it was. And that's how they identified that one specific pheromone. Um, what's also interesting is they got themselves mutant flies that lacked taste and mutant flies that lacked scent and or a sense of smell and then they were able to see who was still attracted to this signal and so they were able to figure out that it was a scent from that awesome yeah so this was a multi-layered experiment right? to figure out exactly what was going on now the thing where this gets really interesting is that it's possible since these very rudimentary organisms these fruit flies have this system they're hoping that other insects such as mosquitoes have a similar pheromone signaling system. And if they do, we can use that to our advantage in areas, in areas where malaria is a big problem to or discourage. Or you could use it to get rid of fruit flies too. But the idea is that you could actually use it to attract mosquitoes away from areas where they could yeah. be a problem. And if you get enough of them, folks, you might even attract the ladies. <laughs> 
Yeah. Always important. Yeah. All right. You want to be attractive to people? Stick around for the second half of This Week in Science. That'll do it. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Thanks for listening to Twist. Twist, if you love us so much, has merchandise that you might enjoy as well. Hats, shirts, bags, Christmas ornaments, all those kinds of wonderful things exist in our Zazzle store where you can buy them and then get them and wear them and enjoy them and share your love of twists emblazoned all over whatever part of the body you decide to clothe with our clothing. Anyway, head on over to twist.org, click on the Zazzle store link and buy our stuff because that helps out us helps us out as well as putting some clothes on your back or an ornament on your tree or stamps on your envelope, whatever you need. Twist is also supported by donations supported by donations from listeners just like you. Your donations pay for our hosting bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, fun things we try to do for the show, equipment that we need, $2, $5, $200, whatever you're able to give really helps out every week of every month keeping this show going and helping us try to do new things. So we currently accept donations a couple of ways. First, we have PayPal donation buttons all over the website. It makes it super easy. You just go to the website, twist.org, look for those little PayPal buttons, click, 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 and you donate. So easy. Additionally, we have a Patreon account. So if you want to donate on an ongoing week-by-week -week basis, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash This Week in Science. That's Patreon dot com slash This Week in Science and become a patron of our science producing art. Whichever you prefer, head on over to twist.org. The links are all there. Check out the most recent episode and comment on the show and make a donation. But if you can't make a donation, we can always use your help to get more people listening to Twist. Get the word out. Use your social networks for science and for twists. Tell people to tune in. That would really help us out. Oh, and um, if you listen to us on iTunes, you can help by posting a review of twists and maybe giving the thumbs up to recent reviews that were really helpful to you. That would be nice also. We thank you for your support. We couldn't do this without you. Your guru assures if you follow his regimen, you will become a most excellent specimen. The power to live on and on for all days is right at your fingertips if someone pays. He says that his aura will keep you alive for three easy installments of 10.95. The device he uses sucks out the bad juices And leaves no bad bruises It simply deduces The proper percentage of X in the brain This miracle cure leaves no permanent pain And still You can't believe what a skeptic I am I can't believe you believe in that plan and we are back with more this week in science. Kiki, Kiki, this is this is normally the part in the show when I uh, I roll right into my uh, next story. But I yeah. am so excited by your story that you've got that uh, I want to talk about that one first. Okay, which one is that? Because the I do birds. have a couple. I want the bird tree. I teased what? it in my. I teased it in the disclaimer. I teased it in the disclaimer. I am so excited by this story. Well, do you want this to roll with a... it? You've read it. No, no, no. I don't have it. I just, I just <laughs> read it, and I'm like, wow, this is so fascinating. This it is, is like, very there's cool. Connections, there's connections in this that I would not have graphed out if somebody were to say, 
Justin, rearrange the bird tree into uh, bird tree of life into something that makes sense. This is not at all what I would have come up with. Well, maybe you would. I mean, it does kind of make sense with the groups of birds that we have now. But um, anyway, what these researchers have done is a new analysis using the genomes of bird species. And, in, and for this, they used 200 species, almost 200 species. Um, and the thing, though, the genome, even for the, you know, bird genome is still pretty big so using the whole genome you can either look at a few genomes that you look at almost the whole thing or you can look at little bits of a lot of genomes and that's what they did they took this almost 200 species and took a little bit about a fifth of the typical bird genome and analyzed it um, they analyzed, analyzed it to suss out differences and similarities. And so uh, the problem when we look at only a few species is something called long branch attraction. And so when a single base mutates, that's a base, the base is, uh, can, has only three possible options. It can turn into what? It can turn into the other three uh, nucleotides that it is not. Right? So there are four nucleotides in DNA, so it can mutate into any of the other three. And sometimes those choices are limited and it will only mutate into you know, two of the other, other three, uh, one of two of the other three. Anyhow, um, lineages that are not closely related because of mutations over time can start to look like each other. And so that becomes a problem. So when you have branches that are separated a long time by history, but they kind of look like each other, you think that they're more closely related than they actually are. And so this long branch attraction problem can be a big problem. So using a lot of species like they did gets around this problem. So you start looking at little, little, little clusters. You break it all up. You break up the branches, start looking at things. And what they found is that uh, all basically everything? It's it's kind of kind of like a well duh, because the the bird family tree was started based on the last analysis. There was some stuff that didn't quite make sense, but this there's some more stuff that makes sense in this one. So water birds, the diving, wading, and shorebirds, all ended up in a single group, which you kind of go, oh, awesome, huh. great. Um, yep. So the cranes and their close relatives also egrets, others, uh, things that you'd think are their close relatives, are their close relatives. Um, and then uh, they have one lineage that... And, and, and something, sorry, to, to jump in, something that was interesting to me on that is that yeah. they weren't, they, there was no example of uh, a, a, a crossover between water and that land and tree bird, right? There wasn't a, right. they couldn't find an example of a bird that was like, you know what, I like fish. Fish are down there. You know what? I'm going to try going mm -hmm. under. I'm going to go into the water and grab me a fish. I'm just going to try it. I'm just going to start that practice and evolve it. No, it, it's, it shows that this hat, whatever uh, behavioral trait that is, is sort of an ancient one and it's carried mm -hmm. within those birds. And it's not something that you can just sort of pick up through uh, a, a, a pressure in nature uh, that sort of forces you to think outside of the tree or the perch or whatever it is and become uh, a water bird over time like it's it's sort of that that's a separate whole category of the bird family right and one particular uh, species which kind of branched has a it, it, we've always thought it's a strange bird because it eats uh, eats leaves and has to ruminate on the yes. on those leaves the stink bird the Watson the Watson. The Watson. The Watson. The Watson is the very strange leaf-eating bird. It actually seems to have branched off somewhere around 64 million years ago. So it branched off on its own little track a long time ago. But it's so neat to know that it has stuck around for that long without really, you know, without speciating, without 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 having many other uh, relatives. Um, and then they, they, we find that the majority of birds 
might be descendants of a raptor-like predator. And, and while birds did come from Jurassic-era dinosaurs, that's not the thing we're talking about, that a, a raptor-like early bird, so like an eagle, like a hawk, was probably something that was like an ancient eagle or hawk was the modern ancestor of most modern birds. Which would make sense because we say that the closest thing to a T-Rex that we have these days is a chicken, and chickens are not predators, but the T-Rex was, or at least a scavenger. So it makes sense that that would give way to this raptorial bird that would later give way. It's, I think it's just we we are convinced based on potentially more human-centered thinking that eating meat is the more complex trait. But that's right. not always the case. For example, hippos came from an animal that was probably a carnivore, but they eat plants now. So, so here's the ones. Here's the ones that I the, the the things in this story though that were to me, I the ones that I would not have connected anywhere closely in this tree. Um, they found a close connection between owls and toucans and other hornbills. That is that is something I would That's not. Weird. Have. That I would not have put no. together. Uh, and they say that also that falcons are closely related to parrots and songbirds. This, again, uh, a connection that would have been really far away on my graph yeah. thing. And then uh, they, they also confirmed that there is uh, the nocturnal nightjar, which looks sort of like a tiny, I don't know, hawk, but not very talony. Uh, is uh, it's a bird with long wings, short legs, and a very short bill, is uh, closer related to the hummingbird. Yes. So that was the thing that I had never thought about, was that all these raptorial birds, they're actually a polyphyletic group. If you mix hawks with eagles, with owls, with falcons, that's a polyphyletic group. That's not a complete arm of a family tree. They're all mixed up all over the bird group. Well, yeah, I mean, the owl is closer to a toucan yeah. than, than a hawk, which you yeah. think of them with the talony, predatory, you know, kind of thing going on, that they'd be much closer. Right? But what the idea is now is that they all came from a talony, raptory thing, yes. and that actually these perching birds got different feet, and the raptorial foot is the ancestral foot. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Which is not what we had expected. And I do think it has to do with this notion that meat eating is the more complex trait. And and I think I, I would disagree with that. I would have already I would have gone with the uh, with the talon foot as being the older foot. I would have assumed that. that's, <laughs> that's the one part that's the one part in my chart of, of mistakes. That would have been closest aligned to the actual finding. See, but because the raptorial foot is so advanced in so many ways, and the way that it can grab and grip and tear... Which and tells you it should be the oldest existing trait. The fact that it's so efficient, the fact that it's so good at what it That's not usually how it works, though. Usually, the... The newer, the, the newer traits are going to be the ones that are less, uh, less versatile. I think. That's Less it. versatile, yes. Mm-hmm. But that's what I would say, is that the talon is specialized for tearing, grabbing, tearing and grabbing talon. meat. You can yes, see yes. and that perching birds have these much weaker feet. And so I would say that they are less specialized. Yes, and therefore less uh, evolved, or less, uh, probably have less of it. Because, I mean, this is, this is a creature less that... Less evolved. Has, well, what are not you talking less about time wise, but less uh, uh, less ancient, uh, less of a less a ancient. Okay. That's what I meant. Right more now. recent. Uh, more actually, more evolved. I should say more evolved. You're more right. Recent. That's what I said more completely evolved. wrong. Because the the trait that uh, existed for you know hundred million years in uh, dinosaurs, uh, you know, or sixty something million years for the the talony things. They are becoming specialized to their own ecosystems and mm-hmm. habitats. Mm-hmm. Scott, it's yeah. a good trait. Don't give it up. All right, so tell me about these skirmions. Right? I don't even know how to pronounce this. <laughs> Skyrim? Skyrimons? 
Uh, scare me on. Scare me on. Let's go with scare me on. The future of data storage may be closer than we think, uh, thanks to research that was begun uh, right here. Not where you are, but right here where I am, UC Davis. The scare me on magnetic configuration is predicted to be stable. This is out of the Wikipedia. Because the atomic spins, which are oriented opposite those of the surrounding thin film, cannot flip around to align themselves with the rest of the atoms in the film uh, without overcoming some sort of an energy barrier. So this is, this is if you think of atomic spin and then you get magnetic direction, like a compass will point one way or the other, these are, are spinning around. They're all pointing out in every direction or forming some sort of a vortex. So there is no flipping... Uh, ability in these. If they could be made stable, they would revolutionize data storage in that they would require less power to create uh, the storage, as well as being nearly impervious to magnetic or structural decay that often deteriorates modern data storage. So now you have a flip floppy disk that will last forever. Okay? That's the theory anyway, but this state has only been seen under extreme low lab conditions with powerful magnetic forces being applied and stability it seems is unachievable outside of this laboratory condition. Until now, thanks to research team uh, including scientists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, the exotic ring-shaped magnetic effects have been coaxed out of the physicist's deep freeze with a straightforward method that creates magnetic skirmions under ambient room conditions. The achievement brings skirmions a step closer for use in real-world data storage. Uh, so while NIST's Dustin Gilbert was a graduate student at Kai Leo's lab, the University of California at Davis, he and Leo not only designed an approach to make the quantum objects, this is actually probably what they were mostly focusing on, just trying to see them, trying to create this object. Very difficult to create even in the extreme laboratory conditions. Uh, they also... Also, their creation remains stable at room temperature without a magnetic field, meaning they had a sort of solid-state version of this created in the lab. Uh, That's so, awesome. So right. all of a sudden they go from this low temperature, super-cooled thing that can only happen in the lab to something that could potentially go elsewhere. You go anywhere, right? Yeah. So they took... It t they went to NIST to confirm the Skirmion's existence uh, uh, to make sure that this is what they... like. You know, I, you know, it's one of those moments in science where that's what it looks like. I think it looks like that. You think this is what you're seeing. Can it really be what we're seeing? Maybe we're just too excited. Maybe. So then they go. Uh, they <laughs> they take it to, uh, where do they go? They went to the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory uh, as well as uh, Neutron Research, NCRNR, uh, that had just developed the state of art state-of-art polarized neutron reflectometer that was best suited to study this stuff. Anyway, uh, confirmation. Yes, they did it. Awesome. So this is the this is something that could be like high level, lots of memory, low energy input, yeah. and that's awesome. Yeah, according to Gilbert, the findings should interest anyone following spintronics, a uh, field that aims to use magnetic effects such as those Gearmions exhibit for information storage and processing. Uh, Cody Voice, the idea has been discussed, uh, that has been discussed is that, for example, you could just push these stable magnetic bundles in single file down a line and read their data. The advantage here is that you'd need way less power to push them around than any other method proposed by spin, than any other method proposed by Spintronics. And, uh, yeah. So what we need to do next is figure out how to make them move around. But for now, we can start exploring now we might use skirmions in technology. The playground is open. I love yeah, that. well, Playgrounds. if they are going to be that good at holding on to information and not losing touch on the data that, that it holds, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would want in a, uh, a spaceship. Or, or in, on a spaceship, you know? Or if there's a computer yeah. on a spaceship. You want this kind of memory, so there aren't going to be any random errors. Or in 60s, 70s BBC storage, so that we would still have the last episodes of Doctor Who. There, there is that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Ah, so um, Justin, would you say that uh, you appreciate conspiracy theories or that you do not? I would I would say that I definitely do not, but uh, whenever I'm confronted with one, I like to try to come up with one of my own. I do have I do have this 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 desire to counter conspiracy theory with an even more uh, intricately complexly wound web of uh, intrigue and collusion. And so for both of you, would you guess that conspiracy theorists are more or less likely to see patterns where there are none? Hmm. Uh, you would think they'd be more likely to see patterns. Because yeah, that's make... what they're saying is, oh, in The Shining, that boy's wearing that sweater with a spaceship on it, and that means Stanley Kubrick filmed the moon landing. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I didn't know that <laughs> oh, one. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a part of it. That's part that's of it. That's amazing. Wow. All right, Justin, what's your guess? Uh, ability to make connections is a thing. Um, I don't know. So, I don't know. So, there's a, that's a very t tricky question, and I'm just going to take a sec. To Let's see... Well, to that's see a pattern that's to... actually there versus creating one without yes. it being there, that's a tough one. I would say no. I'm going to say, I'm going to go the other way and say they're worse at seeing actual patterns. All right. <laughs> well, a group of researchers in Switzerland and France were checking out uh, people's judgments of randomness and uh, whether or not they believed in conspiracy theories. And they did this using three different experiments. They looked at people's perceptions of, of randomness. So they took 100, around 100 participants, and they were all psychology undergraduates, and they had them look at a sequence, a list of sequences. So it would be like a list, so one sequence. That would be XXXOO, XOOOOOX. X, 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 O, 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 X, and so on down the line. And then the people had to guess whether they were randomly generated by, toin by coin toss <laughs> or whether um, uh, versus meaningful sequences. So were they something like a sports team's losses and wins? Did the X's and O's represent something positive and negative or something meaningful? So was it random or was it meaningful? Um, and then people had to assess that. And so in doing that, they also uh, the, they also tried to a ask them questions about politics and where they tended to fit in in relation to uh, conspiracist thinking. And everything kind of fit in. Um, people's abilities to judge randomness fit in well with the researchers' past work. Um, and then they also found... Um, uh, that people who showed a high likelihood of having conspiracist thinking were more likely to believe in conspiracy rumors that have circulated hmm. in the world. So in the tests, they were given tests on conspiracist thinking, and if they were more likely to agree with that in the test, they're more likely to believe the rumors in the real world. So um, there was no no link at all between their ability to judge randomness and conspiracist thinking. Okay, I have None a whatsoever. no I link whatsoever. An interesting idea. Okay, we should do this study with extremely devout religious people. And so this is what they found. I think that's a great point. And so what they found is that people tended to be more likely to have conspiracist thought patterns if they were uh, more conservative leaning. So if there were more, I mean, we're talking about people, uh, it's not, you know, Republican versus Democrat or conservative um, versus progressive because it's Switzerland and France, but similarly it's more, um, more conservative led to more conspiracist thoughts. And so, um, hmm. and uh, they had a, they had a test in one interesting one, there was a, they tested where there was a difference between people f determining neutral and evil human intentions, malevolence. And so they had each group being about 60 people, and one was told that some of the letters were the product of coin tosses and totally random, and some were made up by humans. And the other group was told that some were coin tosses and some were the product of cheating. 
and so that people had like cheated and done this. And so, um, again, hmm. people randomness and conspiracy think thinking did not line up. Um, but they did find um, uh, they were given the same thing. They said the conspiracy. Pessimists were more likely to see cheating, and people with more right-wing political beliefs were, were more likely to believe the conspiracy thinking. Um, and so, yeah, the, when so you I, got I the actual I, when you got the actual malevolence yeah. into it, it was a little bit different. Yeah. So here, here's what I, I think that this is. I think that there's. It depends on what. I bet you anything. It depends on when you do this study, because I can tell you right now. Whenever there is, it seems, a Democrat and the President of the United States, right-wing conspiracy theories flourish. We had black helicopters under Clinton. We've got, you know, we had a oh, ton of this stuff goes on. It's just insane, right? Um, but Ugh. Oh, no. It's a conspiracy. They shut him down. <laughs> they shut him down. It's a conspiracy. So the, what I what I wanted to oh, say. Can I please? Oh, go ahead. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I, you I'm on first. But I think when when there's when there's a right wing government in place or a a right uh, Republican in this you know conservative presidency, I think the liberal uh, wing gets very conspiratorial about things. And I, I bet you anything, it has to do with sort of a political control in this country. If you go back enough years, you could say, in the uh, 70s, those who had conspiratorial uh, philosophies were probably all liberals because of Kennedy, right? You know, uh, so I bet you it really depends on when you're doing this study, uh, the, what sort of mindset is a little bit more or less likely to believe the information that they're getting. That could be true. However, the study was done in Europe again, so not really related well, to the well, American government. Okay, so I'm thinking in terms of the American government. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking I mean, it's still maybe Western that's, civilization. Maybe that's but, the yeah. same case there. Yeah. yeah, but what I was wondering is, so one of the most devoutly religious people I ever knew swore to me once that Jesus Christ was talking to him through his mail. Oh dear, <laughs> because he had heard this person speak on the Christian radio station that he listened to that day, and then that person had sent him a letter. I think that's just... The exact just, same day. I think that's just someone who's a little crazy. Could well, be. Well, However, yeah. I have met lots of other religious people who talk about miracles, right? And a lot of these miracles, you and I see them and go, no, that's called a coincidence. <laughs> and it's something that I think it would be very interesting to study with this exact same study to look at the degree to which someone believes in miracles or angels or all of these things and to see if they were more likely to see patterns. Yeah, and, well, and I'll tell somewhat. you, there's probably more left-wingers who are afraid that the air purifier in the room, that they can actually, they think they can actually smell the ozone coming off of it and that it's giving them a headache. Look, like, the, the wingnut core... <laughs> Whatever species it is, it does this, right? Sure. Uh, and, and I think having a, I think it comes down to education too. I think the more educated that you are, the less likely you're going to make connections between things that aren't actually there. Which is why I so, thought that the uh, that that the, the the ability to actually see a pattern and the ability to come up with a conspiratorial scenario were not going to be connected. Because when you can actually see a pattern, you don't have to fill in data all around it to create the scenario. And it's that filling in of data because you don't recognize the actual data. It's like somebody who can't actually see the full color spectrum, assuming what colors are present. You know, you have to guess and make those connections in your brain. Chapman University has just released its second annual Chapman University Survey of American Fears. Uh, they asked respondents about 88 fears across a range of categories, including uh, government, crime, the environment, future technology, aging, sickness, health, natural man-made disasters, claustrophobia, clowns, other personal anxieties, all sorts Spiders. of other things. Yeah, one of the pieces of fun that came out of this is that um, they say the characteristics of people who believe in the paranormal are that they have low levels of church attendance, they are non-white, they are Catholic, 
no college degree, female, unmarried, and living in the Northeast. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly how this ties in with the, the conspiracy theories, but I was no, maybe or maybe yeah. that just zeroes in on where the devil lives. Exactly. The devil is actually he's in, in the, the Northeast. North the this devil is where, is he's in New Jersey, paranormal. right? This That's is right. where the paranormal activity is emanating from. This is what this is what we've actually clued into. Now we know where to track it. Now, now we know where to go. Mm. Yeah, the number one um, fear of the American public is corruption of government officials. Too late. Eight <gasps> percent. Yeah. Second is cyber terrorism. Corporate tracking Sorry. of personal information is third. Terrorist attacks are fourth. Government tracking of personal information is fifth. Bio warfare six, identity theft seven, economic collapse eighth, running out of money in the future is ninth, and tenth is credit card fraud. These are the things wow. Americans fear. Can't believe uh, uh, crony capitalism or capitalism uh, watchdogging your every move wasn't part of that. You're worried about the government doing it, but not uh, not big biz. Oh yeah, and um, also along weird things that could have conspiracy theories tied up to them. Uh, this week, today, we've been hearing a lot about a strange star that has been discovered and been looked at by citizen scientists. And this star, KIC 8462852, it acts really weird. It's it's. It's one or more that it was observed by the Kepler mission, but uh, couldn't really look at it. They couldn't look at everything, so they passed it all out to to citizen scientists to check it out. But anyway, it's more massive, hotter, and brighter than the sun, according to Phil Plate. It's about 1,500 light years away between uh, over by the Swan Cygnus. Uh, you can't really see it with the naked eye, but you can see it with a nice telescope. And there are dips in the light, which is good. I mean, that means that there's stuff moving around it, but they aren't periodic, and so they can also be really, really deep. So all of a sudden, just the light gets dimmed by a huge amount. One, one time, uh, it dropped by 15%, and another by 22%, which is just unheard of in looking at um, the occultation of a star and the, and the shadow that, that occurs when something passes in front of it. <laughs> so anyway, people are trying to figure out, even the researchers involved in figuring out what's going on, um, they're saying that there's hundreds. And so you'd think that this would be like, oh, it's a young star forming. It's a new planetary system forming. But no, it's actually a really old star. Um, and it, there are lots of weirdnesses. And the researchers have been trying to eliminate the causes of it and so they thought maybe there's a, a planetary impact but that would have caused a lot of debris and dust clouds and that debris would have would have changed uh, would have changed the way it would see you would see it because it would have a lot more infrared light coming from the star because of the dust but we don't see any infrared light from the star so okay there's not a lot of dust going on all right um, what else is going on? They're also thinking there's a bunch of comets orbiting the star, and that could be, they could, these comets could be producing the dips, but um, again, no infrared radiation. Um, other stars could pass, possibly uh, change the comets' trajectories and change the way that things move up and down and, and block light. Um, anyway, there, there's not really a, a, a star close enough to do that. So there's nothing really close enough to move things around it and change the way they move. And so the researchers are like, um, we don't really know what is going on around this star. And so now uh, the lead author on the paper is talking with um, SETI <laughs> about possibly looking at it because, hey, what if um, it was an alien civilization that actually put a bunch of light collecting objects around a star and we're looking at a Dyson sphere? What if it's the Death Star? What if it's the Death Star? Yeah, what if it's something? What if? So, um, researchers are, you know, it's an interesting question. Nobody really knows, but I'm sure there will be a lot of conspiracy theories coming out of this new finding. 
yay, it might be aliens, it might just be some kind of natural thing that we haven't considered, which is probably more likely. But we're going to try and get, uh, the researchers are going to try and get SETI to point some radio telescopes its direction to see if, we, if there are any radio <laughs> radio signals coming. Good call. In that direction, yes. You see that? Let's go look at it. What's there? I don't know. Let's check uh, it out. Yeah, Space we should man. investigate it. Absolutely. You have to do that. We have to investigate it more. That's what science is all about. So what about fracking? Oh, uh, the fracking story. I'll do the, fr I'll do the fracking story in a minute. Relax. Fine. I got a different what story. What the frack? Now. What the frack? Who runs I'll the get, show? Huh? I'll get to the fracking story. This is, but this is a story that actually I think is actually way more interesting. Uh, well, it's just as interesting. This is uh, Daphna Oyserman, uh, Dean's Professor of Psychology and Co-Director of uh, University of Southern California's Center for Mind and Society, did a pretty fun experiment, a uh, social experiment of sorts, where they would give a sort of uh, non-sequitur information or non-sequitur situations or uh, sequitur information to students and then test their cognitive abilities. Now, some of the examples were pretty simple. They would do a, have them read something, uh, 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 read a paper uh, right around Halloween, and the paper would have a back, uh, a back, a pink background, right? And some would be other colors, black or white or whatever. And then they would test their cognitive abilities, and those who we're looking at the pink background right around Valentine's Day. Uh, fared worse on the cognitive test than the rest of them. Now, the next time they did this was not around Valentine's Day, and pink made no difference. Mm -hmm. So he did this. He had all these sorts of weird things he would do. He brought people over for a Fourth of July party, and some of them were passed. That were given Halloween paper plates <laughs> to put their food on, and he found. And he found that those plates, because he would weigh them, he, everybody would make their plates, but he'd secretly sort of weigh them all uh, before he handed them back to them. They weighed less. They were making more conscious food decisions when they had the Halloween plate versus the 4th of July plate. And I, then do this, I do this sort of thing all the time because I can care less about it. Right. I'm like, I'm just going to use the plates I have. <laughs> He had oh. he had uh, a little over 450 people uh, read an obituary and then perform a cognitive test. One of the obituaries was you know that sort of regular they were a good person they left behind a uh, family who loved them they had uh, made some significant effort to do the good thing in life blah blah blah. The others read something that went along the lines of Justin had no hobbies. Made no contribution to society. Rarely shared a kind word or deed with anybody. Right? They read this like totally non-flattering <laughs> obituary. The ones who read the sort of standard thing you would expect to see in obituary performed the uh, eh, meh on the test, the cognitive test. And those who read the really snarky review, <laughs> right, of the person's existence on the planet. I performed much better. <laughs> and so the, the, the outlier of this is that sort of having a, uh, a disfluency with an event can, uh, can actually create more heightened awareness and sort of cognitive alertness. So a, a, nice, a nice subversive uh, message. Uh, to, so, so if you're watching that sort of comedy that, that hits you with random things constantly, yeah, maybe it's good to do that right before a test. Right. Can it, I, can it I makes you think harder that, and though. consider things, yeah. And I can say that as someone who has reviewed a lot of resumes and cover letters recently, don't do that with that stuff. Don't do it with your resume? Don't do it with your resume or your cover letter. The snarky resumes and cover letters, the ones that have funny colored text, the ones that have some sort of clip art on it, no. <laughs> don't clip do that. Art on a resume? Don't put clip art on a resume. Yeah. I'm just going to say no. Although my objective is always to work for your company. I always put that. Like, 
What? What do you mean? What's my objective? I, what do you think I'm giving you this for? Take the objective off your resume. Okay, I'll take it off my resume. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, and this one I'm not going to go too, uh, too great a depth, but uh, uh, proximity to fracking industry wells is associated with premature birth. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so this is... this shocking. is Shocking. Yeah, I know. It's not really that <laughs> shocking. Uh, US, uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say that the perimeter-related causes of death together accounted for 35% of all infant deaths in 2010, more than any other single cause. Being born prematurely is also a leading cause of long-term neurological disabilities in children. Preterm uh, birth costs the U.S. health care system more than, cost it more than $26 billion in 2005 alone, and 30% increase uh, and high-risk pregnancies in proximity to fracking wells is something that the nation absolutely needs to take into account. And if you factor in the, the dollars, too, if it has to come down to dollars, that $26 billion may uh, put a dent in the, the benefit of uh, getting this fracking uh, uh, natural gas out of the ground. So... Huh. What are there are, the there are better alternatives, people. They, they're staring us in the face. We just need to go after them. Solar, the sun, it stares us in the face every day. Mm -hmm. Right. Tell me about a robotic finger. So if I told you there was a robotic finger that looked, felt, and worked like the real thing, where would you think it came out of? My nose. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think the research came from? Oh, Japan. Japan! Japan. MIT. <laughs> Florida. Florida. <laughs> yeah. So Florida Atlantic U University has designed a novel robotic finger that looks and feels like the real thing. Um, it's made out of, it's a 3D CAD model. Um, it's made from a 3D printer, um, and it uses thermal training. So through a series of heating and cooling, a resistive heat process called joule heating, which involves the passage of electric currents through a conductor that releases heat. So they did that in there, and then also a ultra-cooling process. They were able to make this finger move pretty much exactly like a human finger. Wow. So All in of the articulation... Yeah, and in the yeah. short term, this could actually be used on robots pretty soon, but it would have to be underwater because the cooling part is the part that we have not figured out very well yet. The cooling can take place automatically if it's in the ocean. Then it'll cool on its own the second you turn off the heating part of the process. So we can use this technology pretty soon underwater, but as far as uh, prosthesis goes, it's going to take a little while for us to perfect this technique. So if you're a mermaid. It's probably more that ROVs want to do yeah. things that are less jointed and more um, yeah. smooth. Yeah. No, I could see the application. Grippy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and it would probably underwater, uh, potentially outer space where it is cold. So Also that. Also yes. that, yeah. <laughs> um, how about taking brains and stimulating them? What if... What if I could stimulate your brain in such a way as to make things that you've just kind of gone, meh, I know this, so familiar, not a surprise, whatever, that you basically ignore now because they're so familiar. What if I could stimulate your brain to make you think they were new again? Mm, that's so, and making someone forgetful, basically? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's, uh, you're talking about some sort of virtual LSD. Well, yeah, bringing the novelty back to life okay. again. Um, so anyway, this is not something that has happened in humans, but it is something that has been done in rats. And so researchers have discovered that uh, part of our brain, the perirhinal cortex, fires at a particular frequency, 30 pulses per second when you're exposed to something new. So something novel the in front of your eyes, the perirhinal cortex goes blah, 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 30 hertz, right? This oscillation decreases to 11 hertz when that object becomes familiar. 
And so using optogenetics, where they uh, genetically modified the cells in this part of the brain to respond to blue light, they could light could stimulate with light to cause these neurons to fire at a certain frequency. And so basically they showed the rats pictures of a of a bunny. The bunny got familiar and the rats are like meh stop looking at this this picture of the bunny and so then the rats would go here's the light and they'd shine the light on the brain and zap the perirhinal cortex firing frequency up to 30 hertz and all of a sudden the rats are like I love bunnies bunnies are so interesting <laughs> here's, here's, here's okay. how I think it would look in humans here's how I think it would look in humans what, what, is, what is that is that is that a baseboard? Is that floor trim? What is that? There's this little little strip that's running between my wall and my carpet, and it goes it goes along the wall. I never noticed that before. You know that's everywhere. No, you know that's in every house everywhere across America. There is. We could go. Forget the moon. We could go to the sun and back if we just lined up all of this floor trim. And I'd never really examined. You know it comes in. There's a standard height for it, but it actually it actually doesn't. De it depends on what region of the country you're in. It changes. Sometimes that thing is huge. Sometimes that thing's like three inches high. Some places it's uh, the traditional three quarter inch. But that's everywhere in America right now. Everybody in every household. All of us are surrounded by this all the time. Do you think there's something in it? Do you think this? So a Kiki, <laughs> what is the wiring? beneficial application of this? Because I am i don't quite understand that. Well, number one is understanding that um, this works in practice, that this actually is how this area of the brain works, that researchers had a hunch that because they saw this change in frequency in response to novelty versus familiarity, that that was what happened, but they hadn't caused it to happen. You know, they hadn't caused the firing. But, so by actually making these neurons fire at this rate and causing the behavior that they had seen occur naturally, um, they show that, yes, this is how this area of the brain works. So now we know a little bit more about this area of the brain. Um, and now we can understand, um, you know, not necessarily how, what is going to be done with this. Nothing's necessarily going to be done with this, but um, this is just giving us a little bit more information about how our how our brain works. And so um, something that was brought up in the Science News article that I think was a great, a, a great kind of uh, way to, a great way to think about it is, so faces, right? Sometimes you see faces that you think are familiar, right? Mm-hmm. Or you see someone you've seen a hundred times before, but you don't recognize them, and they're, they seem new to you. Now you can thank your perirhinal cortex. Because it is firing. You can like, it. Oh, we've met before. I'm sorry. It's my... My perirhinal cortex is misfiring. I apologize. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I apologize for not recognizing you. Is that is that also where their name is stored? Because I feel like I recognize the face okay, but it's the name that disappeared. Yeah, no. Is that stored? So I'm no. sorry. Your Different. face is is clearly in my perirhinal cortex. My perirhinal cortex is working just fine. Yeah. But wherever your name was, they shredded it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> exactly. They, didn't, they don't keep files there more than 30 days. I'm so sorry. All right. Have you guys, have we done it? Have we got the stories? I think we well, have made it to the end of yet another episode. We have. Kiki? We've done it. I'd like to give shout outs and say thank you to all our, all our supporters on Patreon. Thank you to Kevin Donald, Wesley Ballard, Ed Dyer, John Ratnaswamy, Steve DeBell, Rudy Garcia, Gerald Sorrells, Greg Guthman, Dave Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts. Patrick Cohen, Shannon Tara Ginsberg, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, EO, Bob Calder, Jaron Lysette, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Jake Jones, Trainer84, Kati, Edvardis Rimkus, Brian Hedrick, Cassie Lester, Sarah Chavez, Stephen Soroyak, Layla, Marshall Clark, Charlene Davidson Henry, 
Don Kamarechka, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele, Dave Friedel, Daryl Lambert, Kevin Parachan, Robert Aston, Stephen B., Dave Wilkinson, Dave Mashinsky, Phil Clark, Rodney Lewis, Braxton Howard, Phil Nadeau, Rick Ramis, Sal Good Sam, Matt Sutter, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane, James Dobson, Steve Goodwin, Kurt Larson, Stefan Insom, Michael George, Craig Landon, Russell Jensen, Mountain Sloth, Jim DePoe, Tara Payne, Alex Wilson, John H. Maloney, Jason Olds, James Noah Wilds, Noah Wiles, Paul West, Alec Doty, Illuma Lama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, TMRO, Miko Pakala, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luthen, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Scott Lajewski, David Simmerly, Tyler Harrison, Ben Rothig, Columbo Ahmed, Gary Swinsburg. One of these days I will get all the way through without annihilating anyone's names. Thank you for all your support on Patreon. If you're interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Also remember that you can help us out simply by telling your friends about twists. On next week's show, we are going to have an interview with uh, scientist Paul Ehrlich. Ooh, so nice. that could be, it'll be talking all about our planet, climate change, and things that are going on um, in relation to a new book that he has out with others. And once again, we're going to be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time, twist.org slash live. You can watch live and join our chat room. But if you don't make it, you can find our past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube or just twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in the iTunes directory, and This Week in Science should show up. Or if you have one of those mobile type of devices, say a phone or some sort of technology pad, you can look for Twist for Droid. That's Twist the number four Droid app in the Android Marketplace. Or simply This Week in Science and anything Apple Marketplacey. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts as well as other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twists somewhere in your subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you have learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science is the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand this week science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Aye, 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 aye. 
because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 A laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. Do 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 do. It's the after show. Do, 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 do. Ooh. Ooh. In the theremin. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm gonna mute you. That's how you play a theremin, is like that. Oh my goodness. Your hand. Yeah. With like volumes this way, I think. And then this is pitch. And then this is like um, frequency of There's the something. waves or something. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I've never tried to play a theremin. I've never tried. I knew someone in college who wanted to build one. Apparently it's not too difficult. No. No, it's not. Okay, I'm muting you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so, you guys in the chat room, you guys in the chat room. Okay, everybody's everybody's good with the GMO thing in the chat room, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everyone in the chat room is good. Okay, I thought people were going to say things about GMO, and I thought I was going to have to do some damage control, but I think... I think you guys are all on the same page. Kevin thinks that awesome. GMOs give you the ability to mate a frog with a stalk of wheat. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Genes from the frog. Potentially. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to go to bed soon. Yeah. How was your uh, climate change thing yesterday? Oh, it was good, but I was so... I'm still so tired. I left San Francisco at 5.30... Uh. And, I, and I got back <laughs> home at 9.30 p.m. And when I was in a long day. Monterey, I was teaching for eight hours. So That is a long day. I'm tired. Good job, though. Good oh. teaching. I taught the, the volunteers at the Monterey Bay Aquarium how to teach people about climate change. Yay! You gave them language and tools. Tools. Indeed. Gord McLeod, I think that is the succinct uh, answer to the, the question of how to explain GMOs. GMOs are great. We've been dealing with GMOs for years. GMOs are all over the place. Corporations and the business of GMOs are not necessarily so great. Corporations are not so great. <laughs> In general. Well, no, and you can't just say all corporations because, you know, there's like mom and pop shops that are sure. corporations because sure. they have, you know, they get, uh, it's good for tax purposes. But 
it's when we get you get the big multi it's the multinational corporations that are very often the ones that don't really think about people anymore as, except as except for as numbers yeah where did where did Justin go are we just going to leave know. without him probably <laughs> Oh, Hot Rod says, uh, I built a lightning in a ball project. They're easy and they can have four circuit parts, nine parts. That sounds like fun. I had, so when I was in Monterey yesterday, I meant to like tweet it out and I didn't take a picture of it, but I got a beer with the other people that, that, we, that I taught with all day at the end at a um, microbrewery in Monterey. And I got a beer uh -huh. called... I got a beer called El Chupacabra. El Chupacabra. Nice. It was very hoppy. It had like 80 bitterness units. 80 bitterness units. Yeah. That's that's substantially bitter. It's very bitter. It's very bitter. Hoppy. That's why it was called El Chupacabra. Chupop. You need to come up here to Portland. You should see all the beer names that are up here. You no, know, I want to. I do love my microbrews. It would be, so many I rooms. want to come. Come to Portland. If, if Twist will buy me the flight, I would be there tomorrow. <laughs> right, right. Need a budget. So I need a reason to go over there that's Twist related. And exactly. Then and then it'll be good. <laughs> so you need to get us into some festival or something. Exactly. I need to get us into something that people would want to pay us for. <laughs> exactly. See, we got this. Yeah. We got it. Simple. No problem at all. No problem at all, says the handy horse. <laughs> handy horse. Handy horse. Well, oh, the head keeps falling off. That's what that's the problem I had. They are they're not made, I mean, if you put the head on your thumb, it doesn't fall off, but then the legs are all on the wrong side of the body. Yeah. Doesn't quite it's work. It's almost as if it was built in China or something. Mm. Uh, made in China. Made in China. Candy horse. That is so cool. Where have you been? My uh, two and a half year old and I today rediscovered together the magic of a, the shadow puppet. Ooh, yeah. that's fun. And we were doing different animals, everything I could think of to, to do, which was basically a bunny, a giraffe, and a dog. Oh, crocodiles, oh, my bear. favorite. Oh, I didn't do crocodiles. So do you, you do, you do, um, it's like that, I think. So you have the eye on the back. Yeah. Hold on. Is it? I it, was never in like a gang as a youth, so I'm really bad at doing You have something. to get some teeth, and you have to get the lower jaw, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, maybe. A good one. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to bed. Yeah, not much of an after show tonight. I'm low energy. Oh. Low energy. Is calling me. I must answer it. All right. I got this. I got this giant contract that I have to sign for oh our sh for our show in New York. Oh my god! This. I have to read this thing. Wow. Okay. Like, well, let me know if if I'm signing off any firstborns or anything. Yeah, that's what I have to figure out. They're like, here's the contract, sign it. And I'm like, okay, last year there wasn't a contract, and it was really awesome. <laughs> I guess this happens. You get you, you get things more set up, and you need things like contracts and stuff. If it leads to a bigger turnout, I'm all for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so January 7th. January 7th, New York City, once again. Great. Right. I'll work out those details. Um, right. Yeah. I'm going to do calendar research this week. 
We're like, oh. I'm just going to send some emails and be like, dear Vistaprint, dear other companies. Yes. Yeah. I want to make these many calendars in this fashion. How much, please? <sighs> yes. So the calendars are happening, everybody. Yes. Be ready. We're so close. Be ready I'm to hoping we order can have, your calendars. We should have an order form up, I'm hoping, by Halloween. Oh, okay. Sweet. Great. I'm really hoping. Um, um, and then my footage from Cabrillo, you Opera, ha now have Opera access says, to. says, show in NYC, what yes, did I miss? I yeah, we're to. going back. Rod, we're uh, going back to the Big Apple. We were there last year to kick off the year. We're going to go back and kick off the year there again. January 7th, Wednesday, January 7th, we will be in New York City. I think it's 10 p.m. Eastern time is the show time. And, um, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll be good letting people know more about it as I figure things out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Do, you, do you know what the M and M bit is? Yeah, Ed. I have to read my contract to find out what I'm legally. I, I don't. That's what I don't know. I thought we were just yeah, going to go but, do a show, but there's but like the, liability and other weird things. And yeah, yeah. The M and M bit though is you put in some only blue. You put in some strange little thing like that, right? Uh, and then if you get there and there aren't only blue, or if you just said take out the blue M and Ms. And there's blue M&Ms there. Uh, that means they didn't read all the details of what you needed. Right. That would be if we were submitting a contract to them. Just or whatever. <laughs> no, I, I get it. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> but uh, that's it's actually the other way. Yeah, it's the other way. And I. Uh, there's all these I, fines and things. What? Fines? Yeah. What's going oh, on? Oh, if we don't show up or something. Well, yeah. Like if if producer fails to load out at the designated time, a storage charge of fifty dollars will be deducted from the security deposit, and then that made me go. What security deposit? What security Wait, deposit? What are we talking about? Yeah. Wait, what? Boy, we're gonna have to make some calls. Excuse me. I don't remember all these conversation things. So line out, line, just line out everything we don't get. <laughs> Like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand this. I'm gonna just cross it out and send it back. This is not yeah, a. This, is not, this does not apply to us. This does not apply. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go. All right. Good night, everyone. Say good night, uh, good Blair. Night. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us once again. I'm gonna go show my contract to to my lawyer. Ha ha. Um. Anyway, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. I hope you're ready for lots more science. Everyone check out Ed's Science Minion Hangout, Science Island Twist Minion Hangout tomorrow, right? Yeah, hopefully we'll get political. This just I hope you can get in there. Get on in there, everybody. Uh, check it okay. out. And we will see you thing. next week. There was one more thing. One more. Oh, nope. no, never mind. Now, I was thinking next week might be the Halloween show, but it's not. No, 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 no. No, it's All like right. two weeks away. All right. Good night. We'll see, see you next week. Bye, everybody.